So next we have chapter 35, the signs and levels of progress. This is actually, excuse me, a very good chapter. This one is by Papa Sambhava. This chapter is also, if you happen to have the book Juniper Ridge, in that book. So uh, here it begins uh, talking about the different signs. It says there are two types of signs, indefinite and definite. So it goes through, this is kind of another, similar to the last chapter, a lot of lists in this one. So the indefinite are known as basic signs due to the connection, a previous connection that someone had, but they're also considered unreliable. So that's one of the things in this chapter that we see over and over. There are reliable things and unreliable things. They are signs, but you can't take them as hard and fast signs, okay? So, so we... Uh, um, are not, he's not going to describe the unreliable ones here, he says, but the definitive signs uh, due to our practice, and these two are two types, changing and unchanging. So again, there's a little flexibility in some of these, and they're more fixed in other cases. So the changing signs can appear in actuality or as moods. Okay? So the first kind for, for Nundro or Rushen practices, basic preliminary practices, your body feels at the brink of collapse, like the walls of a house in shambles, your voice feels worn out, like when exhausted, or you, feel, or you convulse like someone possessed. They have, these indicate that you have separated samsara from nirvana. Okay, so remember, these are changing signs, though, so they're not absolute. And then there are moods. These are also changing. So moods are disenchantment with samsaric body, speech, and mind. So when we become disenchanted with that, so we want to achieve enlightenment. They indicate having purified obscurations of the three realms and separated from samsara. Then the actual signs are the body is blissful, your voice wants to speak out, your mind experiences everything as space. You feel now nothing exists, as well as compassion for beings who fail to realize this, and enthusiasm for the Dharma will also arise. In terms of moods, you forget that you have a body, you don't notice your breathing, you don't Apart from the state of non-thought, thinking this is it. If you think this is it, then you've parted from non-thinking. <laughs> so all these are temporary signs, he says. They're changed, they're not reliable. So next, he says, the main practice signs are having established rikpa, the actual signs are feeling disenchantment with body, speech, and mind the way, in a way that's visible both to yourself and others. Okay, So it's not just you thinking this, but others notice it as well. And then having no interest in the activities of this life. And that's probably a challenge for a lot of us, <laughs> but getting to that level. Your voice is like that of a mute. <laughs> your mind is tired of samsaric things, you have a profound devotion to your guru, and compassion for all beings wells up so that tears flow. There is a trust in the consequence of actions, in you giving up misdeeds and practicing virtue. The mood signs include a lightness of body, even at times forgetting that you have a body, not noticing your breath's movement, and mentally feeling that everything is insubstantial and evescent, evanescent. Uh, all of these signs change and don't last. So the signs of lasting value are the following. When awareness is utterly laid bare without fluctuation and doesn't project experience as being other, that's a sign of having anchored awareness within dharmata. The mood signs, 
No matter where your attention moves, understanding and realizing that it is your own mind, seeing that thoughts are projected and return as self-display, and understanding that they are like space, completely insubstantial, these are signs of having established through the view that appearances are mind. Okay? So when we're going about our daily activities and we see things in that way. To recognize this even while dreaming is the sign you have reached the fullest degree of steadiness. So we need to also do dream yoga as a part of this. And then if you can sustain this for seven years, you will awaken to the state of Nirmanakaya with the vanishing of material body. You don't recognize, if you don't recognize in the dreaming, you will awaken at the time of death. Anyway. Okay. So it takes seven years. You can do it while during this life or at the time of death. Then come the signs of experiencing the state of realization in actuality. Your body, speech, and mind. So body is light and energetic. Your voice is clear and able to express teachings you have never even heard. Your mind at times has some degree of clairvoyance. You see everything lucidly as rainbows, sometimes full of bodily forms and circles, sometimes becoming void without and without reference points. As devotion to your guru grows even deeper, your concern for karmic consequences becomes more relaxed. You feel that your body emits light. At times your body is absent. Your voice speaks unintentionally like an echo. Your mind is clear and blissful and does not project anything. Now and then it turns void and forms no thoughts. All these are occurrences change and cannot be relied upon. The unchanging signs are no longer experiencing in, in which there is no longer any experience in which you cling to solid reality. Everything is sheer luminous display. There is no reference point or clinging. The mind itself is empty. So even while dreaming, you have the fullest degree of steadiness. And if you're able to do this within three years, the body will vanish and achieve the state of Sambhokakaya's intangible wisdom body. Getting closer. Next, the sign that emptiness is spontaneously and effortlessly liberated in itself. Again, looking at body, speech, and mind, the signs in actuality are no attachment to a body, no fear of water, such as no fear of water, the marks of excellence can be witnessed by both you and others. Those, those marks and signs of Buddha. Your voice can express beneficial Dharma teachings simply from you directing your will toward others. So remember the Buddhas don't actually have to speak. It just manifests. In your mind, untainted clairvoyance arises. In terms of moods, the signs are that you neither remember nor even think of clinging to your body, speech, and mind. Whatever you experience is spacious, not taken as real. You feel as if you can move freely through rock, mountains, and the like. The unchanging signs are as follows. No matter what you experience, there is neither any conceptual focus nor any attempt to accept or reject. It is liberated without being assumed to be real, whether day or night, without needing to remember it. Appearance and emptiness are naturally liberated into non-duality. The sign of self-liberation through spontaneous conduct is what we've been doing. And then when dreaming ends, that's the fullest degree, with the fullest degree of steadiness, in one year, the material body will vanish and you will awaken into the state of dharmakaya without remainder. And then 
the sign that self-liberation is brought to consummation. So here's the fullest extent. The fruition is spontaneous presence of the spontaneous presence appears only in others' perception. In your own personal perception, all kinds of signs and indications of progress of the path have ceased. The vision of exhaustion of dharmata, the force appears, uh, the moving force of appearances has ceased. The still qualities of emptiness are no longer. The non-dual nature of appearance and emptiness neither fluctuate nor change in any way whatsoever. Instead, there is a naturally awake quality that transcends meeting and separation, an unfabricated presence, an absence without any dismantling, utterly naked state of where emptiness, free of clinging. Others' perceptions include original wakefulness as an all-pervasive capacity being present and effortless unfolding rupakaya for the welfare of beings. And when I read through this, I think of, of uh, Garchin Rinpoche, <laughs> but others thinking of him in that way. Accordingly, as the basic nature of things is all-pervasive, unless the signs on the path of self-existing wakefulness have reached their fullest degree, there is no understanding of when the time of spontaneously present fruition has arrived and the practice becomes smug and lazy. So we do have to be very careful about that. And then the last part he goes through again and reiterates some of the people within the, the lineage of all of this. So in this one we have now, uh, chapter 36, a song of fruition. So again, continues our topic of fruition here, but this one is from Shabkar. And so I would like to read this one, it's short. Imaho, once more fortunate and only heart children Listen joyfully to this Vajra song. When you have gained realization in this way, the whole phenomenal world is a book of oral instructions and the real mandala. On the multicolored parchment of appearances, awareness, the bamboo pen of self-existing wisdom inscribes the letters of non-fixation that are groundless and primordially free. This is read as non-duality of appearance and emptiness. On the spontaneously perfect mandala of the three thousand-fold universe is sprinkled the water of naturalness. The pathways are the natural lines of the design and your footsteps are the drawings in colored powder. You, your own appearing yet empty body is the form of the divine yidam. Your speech resounding and yet empty, it is Vajra recitation. While your naturally freed and unfixated thoughts are the mind of the deity. The movements of your arms and legs are mudras. The eating and drinking is the dharmata offering. All appearance of form is the body of the deity. All sounds and speech are musical offerings. Beyond keeping and breaking, this is the naturally fulfilled samaya. Whatever else such a practitioner does, he does not need to depend on the teachings of effort, cause and effort, because the state of luminous dharmata, the instructions, the stages of development, and the samayas are all complete. The special quality of the great perfection, fortunate heart children, is the swift and effortless attainment of the marvelous and wondrous cities. If you truly practice in this way, all the concepts of, samaya, of samsara and nirvana are liberated into the primordial ground like clouds vanishing into the sky. When you realize this luminous dharmakaya of self-existing awareness, radiant as the unobstructed sun, you will be able to revive the dead, to comprehend all secrets, and to convert beings by displaying various miraculous powers. Having perfected the virtues of all the paths and levels, people of superior capacity are liberated in this very life. Those of mediocre capacity are liberated at the moment of death. And the ones of inferior, 
inferior capacity will be liberated into the ground of primordial purity in the intermediate state. Thereafter, continuously remaining in the inner space without separation from the wisdoms of the three kayas, they will display emanation bodies to tame whoever needs taming in whatever ways are necessary, thus ceaselessly benefiting beings. Keep the meaning of these words in your heart, and the sign of happiness will surely arise from within. The one who composed this realization in songs is the renunciate Tsoktrop Rangdro. By its virtue may many fortunate disciples swiftly purify the stains of ignorance, emotions, and concepts into the space, the original space of primordial purity, and attain fruition in this very life. A very nice little song there. So the next one, Fruition, our last chapter, number 37 here by Tsele Netzak Rangdrol, again, starts out with the nature of the fruition. He talks about how to accomplish the final fruition, the kayas and wisdoms, that we gradually exhaust the gross, subtle, and extremely subtle defilements, and then wisdom will develop. He gives an example of a skilled doctor and a person who has been blind since birth. The blind person's eyes are opened and they see only gross outlines in the beginning. And then gradually they begin to see everything exactly as it is. So that's kind of an analogy here. Being blinded is only a temporary defilement. And the doctor-like master with his medicine-like oral instructions and treatment opens up the kayas and wisdoms which are like your eyes. This is called fruition. And so then he goes on and talks about the time of liberation. And he compares Mahamudra and Dzogchen and says the dissolution of the aggregates into the Dharma Dhatu without remainder will happen in this lifetime. It's common to both. And he includes here from the Tantra of the Jewel Mound, the unmanifest non-thought, complete openness, great empty cognizant, the four elements vanish like mist into space. For the Togao practitioner, all outer material objects arise due to deluded perception will cease, and the mastery over the inner wisdom, and then we grain, gain the great transformation body. This is one of the different uh, forms of the rainbow body. And like the reflection of the moon in water, you act for the welfare of beings to the limits of the sky. People of middling capacity will have signs of relic bones, relic pills, seed syllables, sounds, earthquakes, rainbows, and a rain of flowers, and be liberated into one of the bardo states. Even those with lesser capacity will have rebirth from a lotus flower into the natural Namanakaya realm. He continues on talking about the kayas, the karma, disturbing emotions, habitual tendencies, dualistic knowledge are naturally purified, and all conceptual thinking is exhausted, remain in an innate, empty, and cognizant state of great bliss called dharmakaya. Dharmakaya is not an object of thought and description and does not lie within the confines of permanence and annihilation. The seeds of bodhicitta are inconceivable, uh, of an inconceivable number of compassionate mnemonicayas, and possess no deliberate notion or concepts such as subject and object. They do not fixate on self and others as separate. They have the qualities and activities of the victorious ones. The three kayas can actually be condensed into two, the dharmakaya and rupakaya. One taste in dharmakaya, like a mirror in its reflection, or the sky in a rainbow. In terms of meaning, they're present as the kayas and the wisdoms. They're beyond change or alteration, inseparable kayas and wisdoms. 
and then he has a, a epilogue verse here. I wanted to just read one of the verses from that one on the last page, 268. Through the primordial purity of Trekcho, strip Ritpa to nakedness without attachment to purify the realms through the luminous displays of Togao. Without hoping for or desiring the signs of the four visions, practice in this way and you will capture the kingdom of Samatvadra. <laughs>